All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. My name is Maureen Conway. I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program here at the Aspen Institute. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our, our fifth conversation in our Reinventing Low Wage Work, Ideas That Can Work for Employees, Employers, and the Economy. Um, it's a, it's a pretty busy time here in D.C. post-election, talking about a lot of different things. So thank you so much for, for choosing this and coming here. And I think you've made a great choice because we really have some, some terrific uh, speakers uh, for you this afternoon and, and a really important conversation to have. Um, I also uh, want to make sure I, I thank um, our sponsors. I'm really um, very pleased with the support from the Ford and the Mott Foundation that has made this series possible, and, and we're really grateful to them for their support and the work they've been doing with us on this series. Um, uh, you have in your materials a, a couple of um, things about uh, the previous conversations we've had and, and, uh, and a piece from um, that uh, Ellen Galinsky and her colleagues are just released. Uh, have just released, but also out on the materials table are a couple of other pieces, as well as um, a nice case study of Cascade Engineering, courtesy of actually our colleagues in the Business and Society program here at the Aspen Institute. So, um, so sometimes our, our work is coordinated. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and just just by way of introduction for this series, I I wanted to. Um, to talk about this conversation, we called this from jobs to job quality. We just came out of an election in which jobs was a very, uh, a very prominent part of the conversation. Um, and sometimes there was a reference to, to we, but, and we need good jobs. We need jobs that can support a, a family. And, you know, I was thinking about that as I uh, was looking at this piece from 60 Minutes, and I don't know how many of you saw it over the weekend. 60 Minutes ran a piece on, um, training and manufacturing in Nevada, and they were profiling sort of th this training program that was um, training folks who'd been out of work for jobs in a, in a manufacturing facility and talking about the kinds of skills and that these skills can be scarce, and they called it three million jobs and who's qualified, and I have some issues with how they use their numbers, but I won't go into that right now. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, but the, but the thing that struck me at the end was so that so these these uh, folks did complete the training program and two of them got full time jobs at the manufacturer that they were profiling, earning twelve dollars an hour. And you know I think the two folks they seemed pretty happy with those jobs that they were getting these jobs that, um, but I thought about it you know so is this what we're talking about when we talk about a good job because at the same time, uh, one of the gentlemen is married and has two kids and I thought well that family, you know twelve dollars an hour they they still qualify for food stamps. Um, so, you know, what are we thinking of that is a good job, and what does it really mean to have a good job? Um, so I think that these are really some hard questions, and so that's why I invited other people here to talk about them. Um, <laughs> so we have a really wonderful panel for you today, and I will just introduce them very briefly, but you have bios in your materials. You can uh, read about their very um, accomplished background. So uh, right next to me is Javier Murillo, president of um, the Service Employees International Union's Local 26 in Minneapolis. Um, let's see who's next to him. Next to him is Fred Keller, uh, chairman and CEO of Cascade Engineering. And we also have Ellen Galinsky, president and co-founder of the Families and Work Institute. And I'm very pleased that we have um, my boss and our uh, executive vice president for policy and public programs, Elliot Gerson, here to moderate this series. Elliot has been um, just tremendously supportive of the work of the Economic Opportunities Program and, and of uh, building this series and bringing it out. And so I'm really pleased that he could make time in what I know is a very busy schedule to come have this conversation with us here today. So thank you, thank Elliot, you. and thank you all for being here. Okay, thank you very much, Maureen. Thank you all for being here, and, and, and I'm, I'm really thrilled uh, to be part of these conversations. Uh, the Economic Opportunity Program has been a long, how, how long has the program been here? Oh, it's, it's 20 years, over 20 years. Over 20 years. <laughs> it's, you know, the Institute now has almost 30 policy <coughs> programs, but the Economic Opportunity Program is, is really the foundation of much of what we do. And now, working around it, we have four others uh, directly focused on issues relating to domestic poverty and uh, improving opportunities for uh, employment, particularly for uh, poor people. And then there are probably another half dozen programs here at the Institute that relate directly uh, or indirectly uh, to these critical goals. And as Maureen was alluding, one of the things we're trying to do at the Institute is try to 
have these programs uh, uh, collaborate and leverage their extraordinary insights into these critical problems that get, frankly, far too less attention in American uh, politics than they deserve. As, as Maureen said, we just did go through uh, uh, a presidential election, obviously. Uh, I can't recall any mention of poverty, uh, which I think is, is shameful. There certainly was a lot of discussion about jobs. Uh, uh, but jobs in the context of, I think, of often sort of focus group tested concepts that would target particular segments of the electorate. But clearly there was also a recognition that what we need are not only jobs, but quality jobs. And in some, in some instances you got a sense of that because of how uh, people would talk about manufacturing jobs, how important it is to restore manufacturing jobs. But it seems to me implicit in that is the question about, well, what about other jobs? Why should there be any jobs uh, that do not allow a family to emerge from poverty? Why does it have to be manufacturing? Why do we countenance so many jobs uh, where people can work extraordinarily hard yet still have no opportunity to improve their family's economic uh, status? So. You know, it, the good news is there's a focus on jobs, not as, as, as good uh, is the fact that they're not drilling down to an understanding of, of the reality of the, of the workplace for so many millions of Americans. And particularly when you consider so much of the American ethos is really that all you need to do is work hard, and if you do work hard, you are assured a place in the middle class and assured an opportunity uh, for your children. Uh, to have better opportunity than you do yourselves. So what, what I'm, I'm going to do uh, before I open it up to all of you who all have tremendous uh, interest and expertise in this area to engage in a conversation is with our panelists uh, touch on a few different areas. First uh, on, on job quality, what, what job quality really means. Uh, then we'll talk some about job skills. We'll talk also about the role of government. And finally, we'll talk some about business practices. Um, but let, let's start, and if, if we can, Ellen, you know, a sort of a central issue that, that Maureen alluded to um, is, is you know, the, the concept of, of, of quality. If, if people do uh, work hard and are willing to work hard, what kind of opportunities are they really going to have? You've been looking at these issues for many, many years. And I wonder if you could just talk to us about the trends uh, that you see in terms of the issues that lower wage workers are are facing, and and what are you know what does make for a quality job that does allow one really to improve one's status, have a middle class lifestyle, have opportunities for their family. Well, I like you was very frustrated by the discussion of jobs, jobs, jobs during the election without any discussion about how could we create jobs that might work for both the employer and the employee. I felt that way during the welfare reform. It's like get a job, get any job, and then people would be surprised at the turn or the turnover. Uh, we have an advantage at the Families and Work Institute that other people might not have, which is we have an ongoing study of the U.S. workforce. We also have a parallel study of the workplace. We have about 600 data points and we can go on a fishing expedition to try to define what a good job is and keep looking at it uh, over time. And by a good job, we look at what are the characteristics of a job that are related to things that matter to employers like retention, like engagement, like job satisfaction. And what are the things that matter to employees like your, your well-being, your health, um, you know, those sorts of things. And so we've just looked at it. We we're actually releasing with you all today, um, uh, thanks to the Ford Foundation, um, a shorter version of two papers that we've been working on. Um, and in these papers, we've defined what are the characteristics. And first, we have to say that economic security is, is critical. Um, in this particular paper, we defined economic security by having access to things like paid health care and and for yourself or for your family and some contribution to your benefits fan plan. It's also um, other things as well, but this is how we define it in this paper. Having some say over how to do your job is important. Um, having an opportunity to learn on the job, because it can be any kind of job, 
but if it doesn't give you learning opportunities on the job itself, and then we think for the Low Wage Workforce Act, access to paid on-the-job training that's relevant and education. Those things are really important. And then um, a supervisor who supports you succeeding in the job. It's always the people, you know, it's always the relationships, stupid, that matter the most. And um, so it's coworker support, it's, it's supervisor support for, um, for succeeding on the job and, and also managing your work and personal life. And then flexibility and and one of the trends that we see is an increasing flexibility that works on behalf of employers but not employees, that people are stuck in, in what I think of as a part-time ghetto. And in our particular national study data, we find that 41% of low-income low workers um, are working part-time and 61% want more time. Um, you know, that's, that's one trend we define um, flexibility by, in this particular paper, 16 different aspects, but it includes paid, paid time for um, your own illness and paid time for your child's illness and, and vacation days and holidays and, and part-time where if you're in part-time you can move to a full-time job and, and if you're in a full-time job you can move part-time. That is, uh, it's the real choice. Flexibility <coughs> has to work for the employer and employee and we find when that when low-income um, employees have access to this kind of good quality job, um, regardless of whatever industry they work in, they're much more likely to be engaged in, in better health and mental health. So it actually begins to level the playing field in ways that are part of that American dream. Uh, F Fred, you, you run a globally competitive business, and obviously you need to compete with all other businesses, uh, with regardless of what kind of personnel and employment practices they have. Tell us a little bit about your business and do you think the kinds of things Ellen described are you know, reasonable conditions for quality work? Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, Cascade Engineering is uh, a company that has about a little over a thousand employees. I started the company about 40 years ago. Um, I was very young. Uh, <laughs> It, it's, um, it's, it's, we've got plants in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, in Ohio, North Carolina, Texas, and in Budapest, Hungary. And we are in a, 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 a as you say, a globally competitive marketplace. We, we, the, I, the, the, in some respects, uh, uh, the, the marketplace drives a lot of our thinking in terms of how we uh, are able to pay our employees. On the other hand, we can do a lot with, with culture, and I was really glad to hear you bring that up, Ellen. I think that's very much a part of it. Um, we, we, um, we have about a third of our employees that, that actually are involved with, with the product of manufacturing, and the rest are indirect, we would say, or, or not directly involved in the, in the product, and that's, that's a, uh, that provides a career opportunity. So we like to think in terms of people coming into the organization and having career opportunities within the organization. So not just a job, but a career. And we've done, uh, one of the subjects in, our, in the paper is, uh, is our Welfare to Career program, where we've learned over the years, about 15 years ago, we started thinking about this process and how do we uh, uh, appropriately and successfully uh, employ people with and retain them uh, that have, are coming from, uh, from poverty. And we learned this whole system of support that's needed uh, for that to happen effectively. And that, that system of support is not only um, important for us as an organization, I mean, when, when you're able to do something like that, when you're able to successfully retain, we retain at 97% plus per month uh, in terms of, of welfare recipients. Prior to that, it was in the 40s and 50s. But we've learned that um, uh, we, by, by providing supports, we're able to have a, a work environment where people want to stay and they are able to stay, and we're able to help them uh, remove the barriers that are, that are uh, confronting them because when you move from welfare to a, uh, a full-time job, there are lots of uh, barriers. There are lots of, of, of new things that have to be learned. So we, we found that that's not only good for them, but it's good for the organization because if we take care of those folks who are in most need, it really reflects on the rest of the organization. And, and it's, uh, there's a little self-interest there, but I like to think of this whole thing as finding something good to do and figuring out how to make it good business. Because if you do, then you've got something unique and, 
and beneficial for uh, for all parties involved. So yeah, I think it's I think it's very much involved in the culture side as well. We do a, um, we do a fair amount of work in trying to create a safe work environment for us to have conversations about race and racism. Uh, we are uh, uh, very involved in that. We have declared ourselves to be an, an anti-racism organization. Uh, that, that, that takes work. We work at that a lot and uh, try to have that safe environment where we can understand the, the issues and, and work at it. Um, we are a certified B Corporation, that stands for Benefit Corporation. Uh, we, uh, we work at uh, um, our, uh, the environmental side with kind of a triple bottom line approach, so not only profits but also uh, benefiting the earth and, and society. And so our, our, um, we, ca our, we call our headquarters building the learning community. You're either there to teach or learn. Uh, and uh, that learning community is, is LEED Platinum certified. So we, we work at all of these angles. And it's, it's, it, it's a sense of pride for the organization. From what you say, I wish you had 200,000 employees and not just 1,000. <laughs> maybe we work on it. Maybe we can look forward to that. Keep growing. Uh, um, Javier, are you... you um, work in, in different kinds of industries and obviously from a very different perspective than, you know, in, in an organizing context. What, just tell us about your experience with this notion of quality and just how difficult it actually has become for American workers to get quality jobs. Yeah, I mean, I <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, so I'm the president of a property services local in, in Minnesota. We represent the janitor, security officers window cleaners, about 6,000 workers, and we're a completely private sector and, uh, and service sector work. And, and I guess sort of sharing sort of the frustration about how we've talked about jobs in, um, in, politi in the political campaigns, but even more, more generally that when we talk about good jobs, that there's often, it seems to me, an accepted assumption that there should be jobs that are that just, aren't good that aren't good that are just you know that that are going to be poverty that that someone you know rather sh I think we should challenge the, the you know the assumption that you know should we say if someone is working 40 hours a week shouldn't at whatever job that person be able to not live in poverty um, and uh, in the work that we do so we actually are entering into contract negotiations this I have a big uh, contract convention this weekend with all of our members um, and uh, but oh, we're also working with um, or uh, um, uh, in the janitorial side with a worker center that um, that organizes workers in retail cleaning which is not which is largely non-union um, and we're organizing uh, workers who work um, at airports in subcontracted uh, work. So at the, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, if you work inside the building, you're a union janitor, um, or if you work at, at say, Target headquarters um, in their corporate offices, the janitors who work in those jobs make close to $15 an hour, have health care benefits, have paid vacation, and such, and that's, they're not wealthy, but they, um, um, and that's true of the folks working inside the airport as, uh, as, as, as well. If you do the same job cleaning inside an airplane, you make minimum wage and work um, uh, largely part-time hours, no benefits whatsoever. Target headquartered, uh, uh, you, you have health care benefits, you have a decent wage. If you work in the retail store as a janitor, you make seven seventy-five an hour, maybe $8 a, uh, an hour, absolutely no benefits. Same work. Um, and interestingly, you know, just because of the way that the, these industries work, our, our members often, uh, sometimes their second job is, or they, is uh, working inside a Target uh, uh, store or have family members. They come from the same communities. It's a largely immigrant uh, uh, workforce. Um, and the difference, of course, is that, uh, and to me, a key component of when we talk about what we need to do in reinventing um, uh, low-wage uh, work is that if the empowerment of workers is not at the center of com the conversation, um, that we will just sort of continue the, the problems as we have. You, uh, you mentioned Ellen sort of having a voice on the, uh, on the job, but that you know, the difference between those two work sites inside Target and inside the Target, uh, target, target headquarters and the store is that workers have, um, have, a, have a union and a contract and, have, and there are requirements for full-time work. I think what we are seeing, sort of nationally, in the in the uh, and globally, uh, really, um, look at the the work of uh, Saket Sony, the Na National um, Guest Workers Alliance. They've done uh, uh, work looking at the Walmart um, 
uh, chain, food, uh, the, the, the sort of the different layers of subcontracting, um, and how a large corporation like Walmart, Walmart will, you know, subcontract to a subcontractor to a subcontractor to a subcontractor, um, and uh, and then uh, and and and. Organize the, and in their organizing work, these workers they call Walmart the employer because it's, it's very important to make the connection that and to and to you know to hold the corporation accountable for the work that the subcontractor the subcontractor the subcontractor uh, does. I think what we are faced with in our in um, our industry and our current um, uh, uh, contract campaign in Minnesota, it's about are we going to be a part of you know the. Um, an economy that is moving increasingly toward that subcontracting, increasingly toward um, a part-timing work, or are we going to move forward? What, what we've done is, you know, we moved our uh, janitorial industry from mostly part-time to now mostly full-time. But that's done because, you know, because workers almost went on strike and, you know, and uh, and 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 fought for that and won it in in a contract. And if we don't have that kind of empowerment as a barrier to the, those uh, those outside forces that lead to part timing, it will just continue on that that path. But let, let, let's turn turn now for a, a few minutes to the the question of of skills, uh, and and getting the necessary skills. Uh, you know, we again hear a lot about about education and its importance. We have a program here at the Aspen Institute. We're very proud of dealing with community colleges in particular and assuring that they do a better job of working with local industry to make sure that the skills that, that the students are getting are going to lead to, um, uh, to good jobs. Uh, you all have experiences in your own perspective, in, in, in your own work about helping workers improve skills. Um, Fred, why don't we begin with you here? And I know that skills development is an important regional strategy in the Grand Rapids area. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what, what you've learned in that experience and, and what really works. I mean, we're, that's what we want to understand. Yeah, um, thanks for that. The, the, uh, about eight years ago, um, anybody in the Department of Labor, uh, Wired Grant uh, was uh, uh, bestowed on West Michigan, and we, uh, that started us thinking about lots of innovations. Uh, Workforce Innovations for Regional Economic Development was the title of that grant. Um, that, was, that was certainly helpful to get us going. Uh, we, out of that, uh, we, we said well, that's a three-year grant, so what do you do after the grant is always the question. And uh, the, what came out of that is what we are now titling Talent 2025. And this is a, um, a, an effort where we are um, taking our 13 county region of West Michigan and aspiring to be a, a top 20 regional talent pool globally. That's our aspiration. That's a good one. That's a, that's a good one, I think, <laughs> right? It's, a, it's a one that uh, you say, well, why would West Michigan? Well. We've got a lot of assets, and uh, we've got a lot of things that we can work on, but it is uh, this particular group called Talent 2025 doesn't do anything. All we do is we, we say we illuminate, we evaluate, and we advocate. And uh, it's really uh, an unlikely group. Uh, it's, it's actually a group of uh, 75 CEOs. Now, CEO is a four-letter word in some circles, but uh, this is actually a wonderful group. Uh, represents about 15% of the people that are working in the region. And we do nothing more than convene, well we do, we do all the, 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 in the within Talent 2025, we, we do all the research to what's our current condition, where is our tra trajectory, what's it look like, what's our needs, and so on. And we're finding some very interesting things. I could talk for half an hour, so I won't do that. But uh, it's really exciting about what we're doing. And if you want to bring up anything in the Q&A, we can do that. But the, uh, the, 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 the role of the CEOs in this, in this case is to be accountability partners with various sectors of the education and the talent system. So for instance, we convened the uh, 13 college and university presidents and asked them, you've got some problems with persistence and graduation rates, what are you doing about it? And what can you do about it? They came up, within three months, they came up with a, a program of a reverse articulation where they're granting uh, associate's degrees as soon as a student from the, that went from a two-year to a four-year institution achieves the, the uh, accreditation, the, 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 um, the, the, the 
it's two-year institution can grant them a uh, an associate's degree, things like that. So this this is a it's a very exciting kind of new new uh, way to think. It came out of the of the DOL grant. We're uh, excited about something like that. You, you know, internally, I, I mentioned that at Cascade, um, we've been working at this idea of welfare to career, and, and, and that has spread now to another group. We can talk about that in a minute as well. But I, it's it's been it's been fun to think about how we talk about it thinking now. About I mean, we love talent. to hear examples of things well, that actually work. Um, <laughs> Well, this is this is a, a program called the Source, and it's not it's uh, it's 19 uh, businesses that have been basically replicating what we've been doing at Cascade Engineering in terms of welfare to career. They now have over 600 uh, welfare recipients, former welfare recipients, that are working, uh, retaining them at the same 97 percent plus uh, rate, and it's a real public-private partnership because we've got DHS social workers actually. Uh, in the factories or in the in the businesses, uh, where they're helping remove the barriers with all the force that that they can do, all the programming they can bring to that, and helping them stay on the job. As as our our social worker likes to say, I, I, I love my job. I'd much rather be working, keeping people on the job, than dealing with the effects of not having a job. So that's a, that's another example of of uh, what we're doing from a regional standpoint. That doesn't the source. Um help people move up the career ladder too yeah, so that if you so that employers are working together so that you can start in a in one kind of job but then begin to move to a little bit more of an advanced job that's what i've always loved about yeah, it yeah it's it's actually uh, it, there's a cooperation there if if there are openings available in in, in one of the other source uh, organizations they're very willing to have them leave one source organization and go to another as they advance their careers Javier, you obviously uh, spend a lot of time working with members to provide them with better skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder, just talk to us about about your experience and 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 things that uh, uh, you know that work to help allow them to to get the opportunities to yeah. you know, improve their skills and get and get better jobs. So I think to this, I'd, I'd say what one of the the things that is often missing when we talk about. Um, about innovation in the workplace or changes, and especially that that um, that, that are, are workers actually being in on the front end on uh, on in discussions of changes. And uh, this was something we uh, dealt with a lot and talked about a lot in, uh, three years ago when we were uh, uh, negotiating the janitorial contract, where we're n knowing that there's a trend in the cleaning industry. Um, to move to greener practices, to, to move to day shift cleaning so that building lights are not on at night and provides cost savings but also um, uh, and, and is, is, is better for the environment. Um, uh, but, uh, that, that, but the way it was happening in some uh, instances, so we had an example of building that went to day shift cleaning where the office workers were um, got notice six weeks in advance of the shift, the, um, uh, of, of the change to day shift cleaning, uh, emails that you know we're going to be moving to this and there will be different practices and you'll see the janitors during the day, et cetera, et cetera. The janitors were given one week notice and told next week you guys will be now working uh, day, um, which is you know a, a abrupt change to make. You have childcare decisions, all these things you have to have to do. Have to do. Um, and they were given an, an English test. Say, well, you're going to have to interact with customers now. So if you don't speak English well, you're not. We'll have to move you to another building. Um, and uh, what we did in our last contract negotiations was actually put the question of green cleaning and day shift cleaning on the forefront. It's very important to me that very often unions are perceived of as sort of standing in the way of innovation or that, that like or of any kind of change. And, and what we're saying is this: this is actually this is wonderful. In many instances, they're very fan, you know day shift cleaning is can be very family friendly hours, but it needs to be done in a way where workers are a part of the, of the front end. You actually, you, there are all, all sorts of ways of training uh, workers in day shift cleaning that don't require um, English. Actually, you do signs and, uh, uh, and, and you just have to get everyone, the office workers and the janitors, on the same page um, about how to, uh, uh, um, to so, so the work can be done well. Um, but to, to, to me, that was. Um, you know, it was incredibly important for us to 
uh, to, to put this on the table to say, we don't want to stand in the way of innovation. We want to be a part of it. We want to be trained. And that, that's an example as well of like, you know, in uh, our local in New York, Local 32 BJ, they've done incredible work for in the, in, um, the areas of uh, green innovations and cleaning for, to provide career ladders for people who like uh, go from being a janitor to um, a, you know, a, cert, a, a lead certified um, supervisor who can, um, who can do inspections in a building for energy efficiencies, things like that. You, so we can, if, if, we are a, if workers are a part of the uh, discussion from the beginning, this can work very well. If it's something that's just, we just sort of say here, you know, this is great, it's great for everyone. It, um, uh, an, an innovation like green cleaning can be absolutely a win-win for everyone if people don't forget that you can't, you know, um, do something like give someone a few days notice to make a radical transformation of their, of their life and schedule. Uh, Ellen, what, what about the, uh, the problems that, that workers face because it's sometimes very difficult to gain skills or get further education while working. You know, it's one of these catch-22s. So, um, you know, w what ideas do you have about how skill development, training, education could be better supported? Um, we actually asked that question of the American Community Survey. Um, it was a report that we were doing um, for, with Corporate Voices for the Gates Foundation where we took 16 to 26 year olds and we looked at um, what was happening to them and what was the difference between people who were staying in school versus um, people who weren't. And what we found, um, also looking at our own data from the National Study of the Changing Workforce, what we found is that um, the people who are more likely to stay in school um, have employed, there's their culture that Fred was talking about, but have um, employers who support learning and training. So there has to be a culture of support for, for developing yourself, for moving on, for gaining skills. And they have flexibility, and, and not the flexibility that is only for the worker, but flex, for the employer, but flexibility that is for the employee and the employer. So they had more ability to, to change their start and top to, uh, stop times and that sort of thing. I actually, though, want to say something else when we think about the, the whole issue of, of education and training, because we focus a lot on content, um, um, you know, the kinds of things that you need to know. but. Um, having spent um, 11 years looking at the research on how kids learn uh, by going out and actually filming the best studies of, of um, cognitive science, neuroscience, and so forth, I've become very passionate about the notion of executive function skills, and um, I think we have to start those early. Um, we, if we think about training for the workforce, we have to be thinking about those with what are they? Ex executive functions uh, skills uh, turn out to be more predictive of life success than your IQ, and they are the ability to pay attention, um, to focus, the ability to have a working memory, remember all the things that you're supposed to do, to be flexible because changing times require flexibility but not to go on automatic, but do what you need to do to achieve a goal. So executive functions are always in pursuit of a goal. And probably a good example is the famous marshmallow test where the kids who could um, sit there and wait for 15 minutes for two marshmallows versus one marshmallow. And you think about that, that's all of those skills are a part of that. And those kids, um, you know, now in their 40s uh, did better uh, later on. And that's just one of hundreds of kinds of studies, but we can promote those skills um, both in the adult. I think it's one of the important ways to reduce the achievement gap and to uh, begin to break the cycle of poverty so that we, we need to, to help uh, adults learn them in their own lives and we need to help teachers teach those to children starting with very young children. And I think we need to teach them to adults. You talked about having clear discussions about racism. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's learning perspective taking, to learn to see how someone else would see the world. And that requires executive function, because you have to put your own opinions on hold to see how someone else might see right. something. So uh, I just think that we need to, um, when we think about the 21st century and how it's different from the 20th century when we talk about 21st century skills, to me, um, uh, the, among the most important things that we can promote 
across the age cycle, because it's going to affect aging too, is to promote executive function skills. Okay, that's my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> I have one too. <laughs> well, it's important to be on a soapbox. Um, let, let's transition again and, and talk a little bit about government role, you know, whether it's safety net kind of a role or regulatory role. And, and Ellen, let's keep you on the soapbox for a okay. minute. Okay, I've got and, one here too. And, and you know, we often think of the government role as, 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 as mainly in the context of safety net programs for people who don't work, but there are also right. important roles for people who do work mm -hmm. and want to change the nature of their work, that where they're not earning enough right. or they don't have benefits or whatever the situation may be. Could you just talk to us a little bit about um, you know, how programs can actually support those who are already uh, working and support working well, families or how they yeah. can become even more effective yep. than what they are? We, we have um, a lot of programs. They're community-based programs. They're state programs, their government programs um, that help people with heating and eyeglasses and foods and earned income tax credit and WIC and a million things that are out there that are, that are not actually being used very much. And so um, we with the Ford Foundation set out on a challenge to see whether we could increase um, work supports, that is people that help people um, get to work and manage the transportation and manage the child care and, and uh, those sorts of things, working through their employer because they get benefits already through their employer. So we, we funded nine projects around the country to see whether they could um, use the work supports that were already available in their communities um, and, um, and by working through the employer. And it was, um, we, we have a paper that we're also releasing today called the Supporting Work Project, but what we, what we found there was you can. I mean, we reached 300,000 employees um, in nine different communities. Um, you, you can do this. It's hard work, though, because people have to become, I don't know, I want to say trilingual. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to see what, because there's so many barriers to, to using these programs. There are hours when people are working. It's, there's a lot of forms. They're set up in a non-trust system, you know, for obvious reasons of abuse. And, and so you have to help the government and employers and the agencies, the community-based organizations, <coughs> learn to understand each other's language and work together. And such simple things like calling people low income didn't work. Calling them thrifty did work sort of applying behavioral economics, mm -hmm. psychology to how to help people use the programs. All those, you know, people thought there was a one size fits all. You can put out one brochure and everyone will come. You can build it, they'll come. No, they didn't come. You know, you, it just, there were such simple, obvious lessons, but they were very learnable. And, and I think it's an important thing for community-based organizations to begin to tap into the employers like your group in your community um, or the unions in their community to take advantage, particularly in such a tough economic time, of the programs that are out there that aren't really, that can really help people and aren't fully being utilized. Fred, you've talked already about source. What, what, as, from a business perspective, what can you say about, you know, the optimal role of government as your partner yeah. in, in, in trying to r improve these circumstances? Okay. How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, it's a huge issue in terms of how we go about the process of making improvements. And the, the, the conclusion, the, the tentative conclusion I've got on all this is that we really have to reverse the process of problem solving from a top-down federal government, state government, uh, local to local informing the state informing the federal government. And I, I really believe that's fundamental to us making any kind of significant improvement in this area. Um, in the example of the source, for instance, I think that could inform uh, policy from the standpoint of how you go about encouraging employers to do this thing, which is obviously a pretty good thing to do. We're, 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 uh, we're, we're demonstrating some pretty good successes here, but it's all on their own dollar, if you will. And now why are they still doing that? It makes, makes some sense. There's a, re, you know, they, the, we, we certainly pitched uh, the employers that there's a return on their investment, and there is. You, you can look at probably 
five to ten times of the investment they put in, but they're paying for the social worker to be there. Uh, they actually pay half of the salary of the social worker. They agree to do that. Uh, they are paying for uh, educational programs. They're paying for these things that, that um, in other countries, uh, we have to face it, you know, we're competing with other countries. They provide all of that uh, and then some. And so we're, we're, we're faced with, with policy that uh, in, in this case is probably doubling up, uh, costing more uh, than in other countries where it would be much less than that. So it's, it's a, I think we need to think fundamentally differently about how we inform uh, government policy. And uh, Javier, another aspect of government policy, of course, is simply enforcing the law. Mm -hmm. And, and with, there are all kinds of laws, whether it's minimum wage or wage an hour or, or, or uh, workplace safety or child labor. Um, and then you talked earlier about the, you know, the fundamental problem was the, the, an additional fundamental problem being simply that there are lots of wages that don't allow one to emerge from poverty. Uh, just you know, from a, from a government legal perspective, uh, you know, the laws that are enforced, that aren't enforced, or that could be enacted, what do you think are some of the most important things that either could be done that are not being done, even though the law requires it, or that laws could be changed to affect? Well, so I come at this question from a perspective of uh, working in an industry that is largely immigrant. And when you look at, at the question of law there, that you have conflicting laws, or laws that, you know, um, that right now our system incur, like we should have, a, 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 we sh I, I guess I'd say we should have um, uh, laws that encourage good corporate behavior and discourage bad. Um, and with the situation with our immigration laws, it's, that's exactly reversed. It's, uh, and um, so, uh, um, so you, you know, at SEIU, you know, the, the labor movement in general has moved dramatically on the question of immigrant rights in the last you know, 20 years from a position of, of xenophobia to um, advocating for immigration reform. And wh why is that is because what, you know, what do we do as a, when we, when we um, organize workers and, and, uh, um, and win contracts? We are raising the floor on wages and benefits in a, in a given market. Um, and if there exists anyone who for any reason can exist below that floor, that's bad for everyone. That's bad for all workers. Um, what we have is right now is, you know, because um, there's uh, fear in the immigrant community and um, very often not, um, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is that whether you are undocumented or not, if you're, you have a right to be paid for work that you, you know, that, that's, you should be paid for work that you do and your employer cannot, uh, you know, has to obey OSHA laws and et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, um, we basically encourage people to go underground right now um, in order to avoid um, these, uh, the, these laws, these, these regulations. I think that in the, you know, in recent years, our direct experience of this, the, under the, the current administration, there was a sense that we would do things differently and that we had very big dramatic raids on workplaces under uh, the Bush administration. They moved to a system of I-9 audits you know, where they, the uh, um, uh, Immigration Custom Enforcement goes into an employer and they check I, um, uh, I-9s of their workers. Um, and this is sort of a kind of a, I think, seen as a kinder, gentler way of immigration enforcement. But what happens to those workers? So they're not deported. They're no longer employed. In our, insta in our case, where this happened to us, we lost 1,500 members in the last four years um, th through these. The workers don't leave uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. They, they just go from a job where um, they're making good wages and they had health care benefits to employers that pay them in cash and are uh, sometimes below minimum wage. Um, so we actually just sort of are, are moving people direct more toward the bad apple employers that we want to discourage from even ex existing. And so to me, it, there, this question of how, like solving um, this uh, problem of our immigration laws is just fundamental, not just for immigrant workers, but for all, all workers because there is that downward pressure that's created by those who exploit our broken immigration system for a profit. 
you, you talked about bad Apple em employers. Let's, let's just shift again, again a little bit to, to employers. Employers' practices, as we've certainly seen from the exemplary practices that Fred's uh, 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 pioneered, um, the practices make a huge difference. Uh, and you know, whether sometimes we hear about high road, low road kind of employers, bad Apple, whatever. Can you give us any experience you've had working, organizing, promoting a particular business that, and to transform them from a low road employer to a high road employer? Well, I mean, I, I think the, uh, a labor management relationship should always work toward that goal, right? That, that you, um, and uh, that, you know, in the, you know, the, the example I gave before, the difference in the, you know, commercial cleaning industry versus retail, um, you know, you, you, in the retail cleaning uh, industry, it's not uncommon, for example, for a worker um, to clean a department store, arrive work at night, they're locked in the store, all night, let out six in the morning, but paid for five hours of work because they're told, well, it's not a big store, so it won't take you that long. So locked in the store. I, I met a person who, this was the, the case for, for them. Um, that is what we are doing uh, in, in Minnesota is partnering with a worker center that is working in the retail cleaning uh, uh, industry um, to, uh, to, to raise standards, uh, standards there because we have the ironic situation that our, our employers in the commercial cleaning industry don't even want, want that work because the, 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 it pays so badly, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the retail industry. But what, we've, uh, what their work, they have actually consolidated a lot of the, um, the, the retail cleaning so that it's um, now mostly done by one um, uh, contractor and now we are organizing that, uh, the, to, uh, uh, that workforce. I think very often, it looks to people, you know, there, there's a, an assumption that, that, especially when it comes to unions, yes, we disagree with our employers at times, you know, contract negotiations and such, but that, but that a, a good employer to me um, is one that is in dialogue with its workforce. Um, and that, you know, in our, in our uh, case, that, that is about the process of negotiating a contract. And, um, and then once that is settled, you are partners in protecting standards um, you know, our, uh, we had a big, almost went to strike but this was six, seven years ago, and at the end it was very acrimonious. And at the end of it, um, one of our employers said to, said to me, no one else will say this to you, but thank you like, but for making such a big you know, public deal about this because I'm going to be able to charge the highest rates I've charged in years because <laughs> they can go to their clients and be like, well, that union's crazy, you know, we got to. <laughs> like, um, and so... <laughs> Uh, an example of a right. speed on the same page because our members got a raise and uh, he got to charge more. But. Ellen, you've been working on, on issues relating to uh, uh, employer practices in the workplace for a long time and you've already talked about uh, that your particular interest in flexibility. And, and I think for many of us who are fortunate enough to work in, in professional environments, the concept of flexibility is easy to understand and most employers seem to have a reasonably easy time, or maybe not easy, but uh, an easier time uh, offering flexibility. But in the low wage context, it means entirely different things. And can you just talk to us about that a bit? No, no, you're right. We do a nationally representative study of the work of workplaces. And so we've been able to track trends now for a, about um, since 1998. And we used to think of of the ideal employer as someone who is, um, you know, the, the the organization man and you know, sort of work centric and and um, work nine to five and and had no other life and you, I guess you could if you work nine to five, but um, you know um, what we've seen is so the ideal worker was kind of the prevailing norm and what we've seen is that. Um, we've had to become more flexible, um, like it or not, because people, because work is, is with technology is 24-7 for, for many people. Um, you can work anytime, anywhere, or every time, everywhere. Um, and you, um, and we're global, so even if you aren't in a global company, you're affected by the global economy, and, and it's very fast-paced and competitive, and, and for all of those reasons, we've had to become more flexible. 
but our our data show that employers have become more flexible around uh, the flexibility is much more likely to be offered for for that ideal worker someone who's better educated um, someone who's in a managerial position someone you know the, the low wage um, or low income workforce has much less access and we've seen flexibility increase around full time work but not around um, any time of reduced time or time away or leave or any of those sorts of things so I mean our, the marching orders are pretty clear of what of what we need to do um, we try though to in, increase the number of good apples I guess that's the one way to say it um, through a project that started with the Sloan Foundation and, and now we're partnering with Sherm to do is is Cassidy here? Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, look right in front of me. My partner at, at Sherm, um, uh, we have a project together now called When Work Works and the idea, we're going out to all 50 states by 2014 and poor baby, she's on the road all the time. I'm glad you're in Washington today. Um, um, but there is that much interest among employers, um, and we work. We, we take a place-based kind of an approach. We work with communities. Uh, we work with communities to have them do education and outreach about what about what these characteristics of effective and flexible workplaces are, um, and do media outreach and educational events. And then we give an award. And we actually can trust the award because two thirds of the winning score comes from employees. Um, there's your listening to employees uh, part of it, and um, and it's around not just f flexibility, but it's around effective, as I've defined it before, workplaces. And so, for today, we pulled together some examples of employers of low wage or low um, income employees who are doing good things. Um, some are unionized, some, some aren't. Some are small, some are mid-sized, some are large. They're in all kinds of different industries, but they actually do listen to employees. I do think that's a common, I mean, people used to figure out how to make it work under the table. Um, and if you just ask them, they have really good ideas. So a company called 1-800-CONTACTS, which is um, a mail order for contact lenses company that's based in Utah. We're having huge problems with turnover and absenteeism, and they, they they had a, the, the proverbial suggestion box kind of notion. They ask employees, and the employees created a point system so that if you could schedule your absences in advance, or you know, you got more points toward more time off, and you know, absenteeism. And they created all different kinds of flexibility schedules um, that work. And and uh, United Airlines in this little handout that we have is another example um, in its uh, call center reservation center and in Houston uh, where they have a tool where, pe where employees can take charge of their own schedules and swap schedules and you can also apply for education and training that way. So it's kind of the principle is, is um, it has to work for the employer and the employee from our point of view and, um, and listen to the employees because they not only can help figure out how to build better cars, uh, but they um, you know, have good ideas for how to make work work better. So that's, you know, here's, here's the report that we do with Sherm every year. It's sort of the zagots of good places to work and hopefully it's gonna get fatter and fatter and fatter. Uh, we've had about 2,000 winners so far. Well, Fred, you probably ought to get the last word on, on business practices, but let, let's stay in, this, in the context of, of, of government and what government can do. Let's just, for the sake of argument, assume that not all employers are as progressive as you are. I know that's probably an unrealistic assumption, but um, <laughs> let's just assume that for a minute, uh, and that government incentives are necessary uh, to make a difference. Can you talk to us a little bit about what incentives you know, might help, might work, and also perhaps what incentives or regulations actually can be counterproductive? I, I know Maureen had mentioned to me, for example, there's some sick leave regulations, I think, now that some say in, involve so much record keeping that it actually interferes with the goal. But you know, just t t tell us a little bit about, uh, from your perspective, what kind of government incentives are in fact important and targeted and, and, and don't create more inefficiency than efficiency. Why did you ask these probing <laughs> questions? These are wonderful. Um, <clears throat> actually, I, you know, um, from a regulation standpoint, um, I, I am, I am uh, 
uh, not necessarily a fan of more regulation. I mean, we, we, and when you're in the business world, you're always looking over your shoulder trying to figure out what's that next regulation I gotta uh, comply with. And it's not, uh, not necessarily a, a fun thing to try to figure that all out and knowing you're at risk of, uh, of uh, um, um, falling afoul of that sort of thing. But we like to think in terms of, um, you know, by the way, I, I, I did an article on me in Inc. Magazine last year, and, and they had under my picture, they put this little banner that said, Regulate Me. And I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, the, the gist of the article was that I wasn't, I wasn't unfavor and unfavorable of, of regulation, but I never said that. <laughs> uh, but the, the, uh, the fact is that, um, you know, some regulation is good. I mean, the safety regulation is a good example of that. You, you just need to have good common sense safety regulation. We think in terms of beyond uh, compliance. Uh, this is not something you want to just kind of skim along the, uh, the minimums. You want to be able to be way beyond that. And that's, it's good for business. It's good for, for us to be uh, thinking about, I mean, you don't want, nobody wants to send an employee home uh, uh, damaged somehow. I mean, that's, that's just not something you want to do. And uh, if you do, it costs money. So why would you do that? I mean, th there's all kinds of good reasons for that sort of thing. So from a, a regulation standpoint, I think that there are there certainly are good regulations, and I'm not sure I'm not one of these that wants to throw all, all regulation out. But it, it does it does get in the way sometimes. Um, and, and part of this is again this this um, this globally competitive work. I, we, I can't overemphasize that, especially from the manufacturing work standpoint. I mean, it's breathtaking how interconnected we are today from the standpoint of our global competition. It's, it's, Presumably uh, that's why you have a plant in Hungary. Well, uh, <laughs> that's part of it, yes. Uh, that's another story, but yes. Um, and, and the, um, but you know, Greece has a little problem and uh, Europe catches a cold and, and China slows down and we slow down. I mean, it's just amazing how this is all interconnected. And so uh, we're still in the manufacturing, we're still under threat of losing more jobs, more more of our business to other low-wage countries, uh, and it's a, it's a it's a constant thing we need to we need to battle. So I think I don't think there isn't any one uh, single approach to this. We need to be problem-solving this this uh, this through. Um, but if I was to imagine something positive, uh, some sort of positive regulation, it would be. I don't think you I don't think you incentivize employers. I, I don't think that you know holding a carrot out there and say you can you can if you do this you get that. I don't think that necessarily works. I do think that there are ways to think in terms of, of uh, perhaps uh, the reward would be the, the easier way to say that. If, 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 if certain things are achieved, it will, it will be, uh, per, you'll be receiving something in, in exchange for that from a, from a cost basis. I don't think anybody's looking for a, um, some sort of a, a methodology that says, uh, if we have the right policy in place, you'll get all these lemmings following this policy. Uh, having said that, I do think there are ways to put in place um, rewards for those who do a good job. Well, I'm going to turn it up over to the audience here in a minute, but before I do that, maybe I'll just ask each of you, if you care to, to uh, just uh, make one recommendation, uh, and you can choose to whom you want to make it. We've, As Maureen said, we've just had a presidential election, but as you said, Fred, maybe some of these issues are best addressed at the local level, so you can have your choice. You're going to make a recommendation to your newly elected mayor, your newly elected governor, or the newly elected president. What is one thing, uh, the highest priority that you would you would give uh, for uh, I improving uh, the low wage work problem? Uh -huh. Javier, <laughs> <laughs> probably something to do with you and organizing. Going back, huh? yeah. Um, well, I, I, I guess I'd go back to what it said at the beginning that that it, um, my challenge to us and to our president and everyone would be to say, shouldn't we think of this as the that the floor is that people should be able to work 40 hours a week who want to work 40 hours a week, and if you work 40 hours a week. You should not live in poverty and should have a job that gives you a life of dignity. Um, I, it seems simple, but we are very, very far from that reality. And much of the conversation that we have about good jobs actually seems to reinforce the notion that there will be jobs that you will have 
that will not provide that for you. And I think that that's a mistake. And I think that when we see the, you know, the, that the, the industries that, I, uh, that, that we organize in, that our members uh, work in, um, that uh, jobs that others consider terrible jobs can become good jobs when workers are empowered to improve the standards in that industry. Fred? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the message I would have is the unit of change is the community and that, that uh, we should look at more policy that encourages that. When we look at, you talk about our mayor, in West Michigan, in our 13 counties, we have 100 units of government. Uh, who, which mayor? Uh, which, which person? I, I'm, I've been studying this, this issue of how do you make change in a community uh, when no one's in charge, basically. There's no one in charge in the community. So how do you do that? How do you go about that process? Fascinating things. And, and I think that what we need is enabling legislation as opposed to restrictive legislation. We need enabling things that, that can allow the communities to, to spend the dollars that they would otherwise send somewhere else, or maybe that comes back, but at least it's allowing them to make decisions. Simple things like where could you spend your WIB dollars, your, your Workforce Investment Board dollars, uh, in training, or would you do that in some, in some way in, uh, to be able to prevent some of the things that are happening as a result of people not having jobs? So, you know, it, can you, where, where could that community better spend their dollars it would, be the, would be the issue for me. Ellen, you have the last word. Well, I actually I gave children in a study a wish for their parents. I asked children, so you gave me a wish, so I'll go to what the children said. I asked children if you had one wish that could improve the way your mother's or your father's work affects your life, what would that wish be? What, what do you all think the kids might wish? More time. More time. Yeah, we asked a representative sample of adults what they thought kids would wish, and most of them said um, more time. That's not what kids wished. Any other guesses? More money? What? More money? <laughs> well, yeah, that was the second wish. More time was third. How, how, how about yeah, pride in their work? Happier. Well, the reverse of that, I'll, I'll tell you. The, the largest proportion of kids wished that their parents were less tired and stressed. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, most of us didn't don't think about it. So if, if I have one wish, um, and I know from our national studies of the U.S. workforce that the health of the American workforce is going down. We have a situation, particularly among men, interestingly enough, men's health has gone down uh, the mm -hmm. most dramatically. Um, and men usually don't self-report poor health, so this is probably um, worse, than, worse than what our self-report studies show. Um, what I would hope, we have, we have people who are underemployed and overemployed. Uh, we, we have overwork has become a word now. I wish that we would tackle the whole issue of, of how we work these days, because I think we can't, we think we can't, but we actually can work more effectively. Um, and, and be more productive. And so um, uh, the president had, in March 2010 had a forum on workplace flexibility that started an, a very interesting dialogue among people who don't usually talk to each other. Uh, employers of low wage workers, union organizers, uh, employers of you know, professional workers, uh, researchers, et cetera. I would like to see that kind of um, forum repeated um, at the White House um, that got a little bit even bigger um, megaphone, but we also tackle in there the way we work today so that we can, uh, healthcare is expensive, we all know that's a huge problem that we're struggling with. We've got to, we've got to figure out how to work in ways so that the kids have a different wish for us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a microphone, uh, and, and if you can uh, just give us your name and affiliation very quickly in a short question, so we'll have time for as many as we can. Yes, the gentleman on the, on the aisle. Hi. Uh, my name is Sam Lakin from Prosperity Projects. This is for Mr. Keller. I had the opportunity a few years ago to work with the West Michigan Strategic Alliance on okay. the Wired Grant. Yep. Um, it's very impressive what they were able to do, as you point out, with really no jurisdictional authority to be able to do it. Uh, currently, I'm working on a project in 10 labor markets around the country dealing with the issues of growth and opportunity. Uh, and I heard you talk about some of the activities going on in West Michigan. What is it, do you think, uh, 
that are the most effective things that can be done on a regional level. And there's plenty on the national level, you know, minimum wage laws, family leave, et cetera. What on the regional level can be done to deal with these quality of uh, work issues and scarcity of work issues? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's what we're trying to address in our Talent 125, frankly. Uh, what we've learned is that the employers are not doing a good job of telegraphing needs. Uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's a good start. And then uh, the, the, uh, the educational side is not good at necessarily uh, wanting to know that information and doing anything with it. So there, there's a, that's a, a big part of it. So dealing with the educational uh, needs of the community and, and we, we learned that this is one of those things that you get a, a little better, more skilled workforce, you get a little more better jobs coming in, more skilled workforce, better jobs, and that's a ratcheting up kind of thing as opposed to waiting for this flyby a business to come in town and you're going to get all these new jobs and then you're going to you know, educate people for them. So it, it really is, a, 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 that, that, that's part of it. But um, so thinking in terms of how we can understand better what our current trajectory is, what our current needs are, and how that's going to grow and where it's going to grow, and then educating to that. And then the workforce uh, training portions are often very disconnected. We're just working on that right now in West Michigan. So that the, the workforce training is more involved with what do you want to learn as opposed to what job is available. It sounds simple, but it's not being done. And so how do we connect those, those uh, issues? So there's a lot of uh, nuts and bolts that can be done, I think, in that area. But it's um, long term has to be a, a, a community understanding of what its future could be. I, 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 just, I, I think without a vision, an understanding of what that community could be doing, where they could be going, and having some, some, uh, some real energy and understanding of that, I think it's very hard to have any kind of workforce development uh, taking place. Next question. <clears throat> Woman on the aisle. Thank you. Um, my name is Edad Mercier with Wider Opportunities for Women. And um, at WOW, we run an initiative called Women in Work. And that initiative works to um, with community organizations and other um, community-based initiatives to help women uh, transition into non-traditional careers, such as construction and manufacturing. Yeah. And um, one of the issues that we consistently encounter is uh, how um, the role of one-stop career centers, and essentially how frontline workers within one-stop career centers, how they're uh, engaging with the workforce, and how they're funneling specifically female workers into different careers that may not provide um, employer-based benefits, et cetera. So I was wondering uh, if the panel could maybe discuss um, the role of one-stop career centers and how much, um, what the impact of that is on the labor force and particularly training um, in terms of the, the workers. Yeah. Who would like to take that? You know, I, I'm, I'm not deeply into one-stop, so I, I, I can, it's a, Sounds like a structural issue more than, but go ahead. Anybody. I mean, I, I think we keep talking about the mismatches all the way along, and you've just you just talked about a mismatch right. between education and and the jobs that are there, and you're talking about a mismatch um, there. Um, I, I guess my question comes back to to Fred saying that you've got real leadership in your community to be able to, um, to move ahead. But that didn't just happen. I mean, mm -hmm. so how do you if, you, if you believe in this bottom up that could make the one stops more effective, for example, in a community, et cetera, how, how would you nurture and create mm -hmm. that leadership that's going to make a, a because we've also all yeah. seen communities that are disasters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what do we need to do to create that kind of leadership where the agencies in an organization can work together? We work with one stops in our supporting work project and, and often there was a, a real disconnect between working with employers, we found too. So. Yeah, um, I, I, and I'll try to bring into a little bit of what you're talking about. But I, I do think that, that uh, we underestimate the ability of 
business leaders to contribute to these problems, to the solutions of these problems. Um, and it's, it, it, I call it the hard head dilemma. Uh, most, most leaders in business have a hard head dilemma. The, the, the heart says, let's do the right thing. The head says, hey, we got a business to run. We got a, we got a payroll to, to, to make. We got to you know, make sure we, we survive. Um, and I, I, I think that we need to engage that dilemma as opposed to putting them in a box. And I think that's probably one of the biggest uh, uh, opportunities that, that you can you have here to engage the leaders. Now, specifically in terms of women in non-traditional jobs, I, I, I think that that is something that, that uh, uh, there, there's, there's got to be some structural roots there that, that people are just kind of stereotyping and they're, they're not doing, the, there's, just, there's not good training that's being done there. Somehow that's not being addressed. And it and, um, seems to me that could be, uh, that's one of those that you, where you have some, some dialogue, people understand it. Uh, we don't put people in, we don't, we don't uh, uh, create camps. Uh, we've just w way too much uh, putting people in, in, a, in assuming that they are going to think a particular way because of their position. We have a lot of positional assumptions going on. So I, I would encourage uh, more community dialogue on that. Uh, in the back row. Hi, uh, my name is Michaelia Davis. I'm an associate with the Ascend program. Uh, we're another program here that Elliot mentioned before that works on some of these issues. Um, this is a question for Fred. Can you share some of the insights you've gained um, around the source? You talked about the 19 companies that are involved in that. How um, and what has worked well in terms of engaging the private sector, as you just mentioned, um, to partner on some of these issues? Yeah, yeah I, I think this, this goes back to um, the, the very first meeting we had with, we had about uh, 10 or 12 uh, employers in a room, and there was a fair amount of, of crossed arms and, uh, and uh, uh, stiff faces like, you want to do what? <laughs> um, and, and it really, uh, it took uh, a, a single guy uh, that uh, was very involved in that, that, that Mark Peters, the head of Butterball Farms, was as, uh, just absolutely on fire to make sure this was going to happen. Uh, so you do need to find the right, you need to find the right leaders. Uh, you need, they, they exist. I believe they exist in every community. Uh, we've been invited and in, we do a little consulting work within, within Cascade Engineering. We try to help with this thing. But there are, there are, uh, are business leaders that are, are um, um, willing to step out. It's, it's an uncomfortable zone for, for most. But uh, it's, it, they're there. There's no question that they're there. And I think we just have to engage it and embrace it. One, one, issue, one uh, organization that we worked with in the Supporting Work Project was Step Up Savannah. And I don't know whether any of you all know Step Up Savannah, but it, it's a community that comes out of the Chamber of Commerce in Savannah. And it's uh, also a person on fire, um, mm -hmm. and then a mayor, and then a second mayor on fire. They actually follow through with what the other one did. Um, but what they've d realized is that, that they've taken a community business case approach, which you could argue for in, in Michigan as well, mm -hmm. um, and said that if their industry and their community is tourism, and if poverty is so rampant, they, don't, they won't really be able to have the, the um, business that they want. They won't be attracting people to Savannah. So that the, the business leaders and the community leaders needs to join together to figure out how to reduce poverty. And they actually take the CEOs through a simulated poverty exercise, which, you know, if you want to ask my personal opinion, if you'd asked me about it before, I would have thought it would be hokey and, you know, a little touchy-feely, except it was actually amazing. I went through it. Uh, but they have tag groups, and they work on issues, and they, they compete with each other to see who can do more about reducing poverty. And it's, again, an example of a community coalition but the, the community business case, I think, is really important. Just like businesses don't tend to do anything unless there's a business case, a self-interested reason to um, want to make an improvement. In this case, uh, we found in the communities that we've worked with, with um, Sherman and in the, uh, our project called When Work Works, is that there's always a community business case for why companies will join together and do something to improve their workforce, workplace, and community. One last question. Um, good afternoon. Ron Hopkins, DC Children's Youth and Best Trust Corporation. Right. This is uh, for Fred also. What is, quote unquote, a good wage for an entry level employee? And if you provided benefits 
and supports, would you remain profitable without government, government incentives? Uh, so you want a number in terms of what the what a good wage is? I, it, it's hard. To, that's hard. That's a hard answer. Hard question. I don't, uh, our entry wages end up being around uh, the average W two ends up being about twenty five thousand uh, dollars, and and they they get with that uh, you know all the health benefits and we have four hundred one k benefits and all that. So I mean that they're they're it's. Um, that's a, you know, is, is that a, is that a, a wonderful middle class wage? No, but is it a place to start and work on their, their skills and develop and go forward? Uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that. Uh, but the, um, the, 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 the idea of looking at uh, uh, jobs as careers and, and having that ability to move, have that mobility it's our job as an employer to help them do that. Why wouldn't that be in our best interest? It's in our best interest, and it's also in their interest. We want them to get better. We want them to have higher skills. We are not standing still in our needs from a skill standpoint. We are constantly spending time and energy. Uh, I forget the numbers we're spending right now, but it's, it's, uh, it's a fair amount of money per employee that we're spending on, on or, you know, improving skills all the time. Um, the, the imposition of uh, everybody's interfacing with computers. That wasn't true 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, everybody is, is uh, required to have some um, um, understanding of the machinery and so on. You know, all these things are important skill sets that we need to be able to continue to, uh, to work at. Did I answer that? Not, so not can totally. We the government profit, profitability. Can we d maintain a profitability? Uh, it's tough. <laughs> uh, it, it's um, it, it's it's uh, it's not easy in today's world. Uh, manufacturing is 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 uh, not in the uh, not in the not, not in the place it was 20 years ago. That's for sure. I, we always we always stop on time here, but before we we finish, and and I, I want to thank uh, our remarkable panelists again. I want to turn things back to Maureen, perhaps just for a minute, if you want to talk about what's to come. Uh, um, thank, thank you, and thank you all for coming. I, I really just want to thank everybody, too. I think we'll be having more conversations in this uh, series coming up, and so uh, please do keep, stay tuned. I also want to note that you do have materials on previous conversations, so if you've missed them, they were great, and you can see them online on our website, and there's other materials with them. So thank you all so much for being here, and thanks to our panel. Thank you.